Welcome everyone to our fourth webinar in this uh, Bringing Water to Life webinar series. My name is John Farner. I'm the Government Public Affairs Director for the Irrigation Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be learning and discussing a bit about telling a positive story about irrigated agriculture. And I'm very fortunate today to have a great presenter talk about some things that the Central Oregon Irrigation District is doing to do exactly this, to tell a positive story. There's a lot of challenges that irrigated agriculture has ahead, and we just want to get out some things that are working, some challenges that they faced, and what's worked and what hasn't, and have a discussion about that. Uh, before that, I want to go through a few slides with you today. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about housekeeping. And for those of you who have participated in one of our webinars in the past, this is the same, same slide we have for each one. Uh, we're going to be having this webinar available on our website, irrigation.org slash webinar underscore series. Give us a couple days to format it and get it up to the website. But if you want to reference any part of the discussion, reference any slides that are given, this is the best way to do that because you have the audio and visual ready to go through that, through that recording that's going to be available on our website. We're going to have a Q&A session with our presenter at the very end of the webinar. Uh, if you have a question for the presenter or for anything that, that's discussed today, please go ahead and type it out in the questions toolbar in your GoToWebinar interface. Uh, type that out. We'll go ahead and get to all of them or try to get to all of them. If we do not get to all of them, we will do our best to get back in touch with you with any answers to questions you may have that weren't addressed live on the webinar. And for those of you who are certified by the Irrigation Association, this is a tier two webinar, so it's worth a half of an, uh, a CEU credit. Uh, just make sure we, if you registered for the webinar, which of course you did through our website, we have record of you registering and attending. Just keep a record of your attendance, mark it down in case you are lucky enough, fortunate enough to get audited um, for your certification that you have a record of your attendance today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Irrigation Association, this is our strategic plan. Our mission, of course, is to promote efficient irrigation, and we do that on a wide variety of ways. And our vision is to recognize authority on irrigation. And one of the ways we do that is to drive discussion and rely on and be, be a, conduit of, a conduit of the resources available throughout the United States. And our webinar today, uh, which is telling the story of what's going on in Oregon, is one of the ways we're doing that. Of course, we focus on professional development, education and training, certification and work, workforce development, as well as advocacy with government affairs, public affairs, and standards and codes. This webinar really is a combination of both. We, we're, we are trying to educate folks on the importance and the value of irrigated agriculture, but then tell a good story as well and promote irrigated agriculture, which falls under the public affairs realm. And of course, we couldn't do any of this without our membership and our volunteers and other resources like the Irrigation Show, which is held every year, and that's part of our organizational competency. So let's talk a little bit about water use in the United States. And for those who have seen me give presentations in the past, I've used this slide uh, many of times. When folks think about water use in the United States, you really think about bathrooms. Unless you're really involved in agriculture and you're really involved in water use policy or water use throughout the United States, you only know what's in front of you. And when you think of water use, you think of where you use water the most, and that's in the restroom. But there are other ways to use water. You might think of a home irrigation system. We at the Irrigation Association also represent and focus on education and certifying professionals in the commercial and residential ir irrigation realm. So if you have an irrigation system, you might think, wow, water is used on my lawn and landscape as well. But maybe agriculture still isn't part of this. If you're a golfer, maybe it's on a golf course and you go out and you see the sprinkler heads, you might drive by a golf course, you live near one, and you see water use there as well. But again, folks, when they sit down at the dinner table, very rarely do they think of the value of water that goes into bringing that food to the table. So whether you're, you sit down at the dinner table and you have you know, with a family or you bring family together for something like Thanksgiving, without water use, without irrigation, without water use in over agriculture, these opportunities would not be readily available or affordable in the United States. So let's talk about agricultural irrigation. I, a lot of times you hear the 70% of fresh water withdrawals throughout the United States. Now this number, I've heard anywhere 
up towards 80 to 85 percent. I've heard numbers as low as 40 or 50 percent of freshwater withdrawals. These numbers are debatable depending on how you count the water, but for the sake of discussion, for the sake of debate, this 60 to 70 percent number is what's readily recognized throughout the United States in terms of agricultural irrigation, uh, agricultural water use uh, throughout the United States. And this does differ throughout the United States. If you're in California, Nebraska, Texas, Alabama, Oregon, it differs. The amount of water used in agriculture does, does differ. The amount of fresh water withdrawals does differ. But when talking of overall numbers, this is the one that's primarily used in the United States. Today, there's approximately 7 billion people on the planet. In 2050, there's 9 billion on the planet, approximately. So there's a plan for this. We're balancing a global human right to water in the context of the right to a sustainable and reliable food supply. And how do we do this? Well, in 2050, 70% more food will be needed. This translates of up to 100% more food in developing nations who do not have the resources we have in the United States to provide food and other resources that come from agriculture. This uh, chart right here shows the amount of hectares per person from 1961 to 2008. So for those of us who were alive in 1961, around in 1961, you'll see here that almost about 0.5 hectares were afforded allotted to you globally. So as a human being in the United States, almost a half a half an hectare of land was yours for clothes you wore, for energy, for food, whatever agriculture produces, that's what was given to you. Now, given the decrease in the amount of cropland available in the United States and the increase in population, we're now down to about 0.23 in 2008, and that's gone down quite a bit from 10 years since then. So we need to be much more efficient, much more, we need to get much more out of the land that we have, much more productive from our land that we have right now with the same amount or even less resources available for agriculture, land, chemicals, and water. And this next chart talks about exactly that. The green line at the very bottom talks about the total farm inputs from 1940 to 2011. Inputs being water, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, other energy that goes into agricultural production. So from 1948 to 2011, it's pretty much stayed, stayed right there. But then you look at uh, productivity and output, and those have really gone up from about the late 1980s on. And that really goes to show the advances in the agricultural system globally and becoming much more efficient, much more productive with the, with the land provided for agricultural use. Uh, let's look at the United States. So this is taken from the Farm and uh, Ranch Irrigation Survey in 2013, and this shows where the acres are that are irrigated throughout the United States. You can see that in the east, mid-Atlantic, northeast, it's, it's very low irrigated acres. And then you move out west, and that's where the irrigation primarily exists. The darker green you have, the more acres that are irrigated. But then let's look at the percentage of acres that are irrigated in those states. All of a sudden, you have a few more states out east that have significant amount of acres that are irrigated, whether it's Maryland or Delaware or Florida or Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, and then up into the upper northwest with Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California being on the upper echelon of irrigated acres for agriculture. So irrigation and water use is relevant throughout the United States, and we need to put more value on what this provides to society and the importance of water use in agriculture throughout the United States as well. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, Sean Ray Hawkins with Stingray Communications. I'm going to unmute her right now. Uh, she's done a lot of work with the Central Oregon Irrigation District as they have, they have faced many challenges to promote the value of ir irrigated agriculture. So I've, we've asked her today to come tell her story and what they've done in Oregon uh, with engaging the community using different ways of getting out a positive story on what they're doing uh, in, the, in the Irrigation District, which translates to some positive um, results for the Irrigation District as well. So Sean Ray, I'm going to throw it up to you, and I'm going to go ahead and give you control over the webinar as well. So Sean Ray. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, 
Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. I'm in Oregon, and so which is pronounced Oregon, not Oregon, by the way. I always feel like I should I should mention that because when I lived on the East Coast, I always had to let people know it's actually Oregon, not Oregon. It's Oregon. So um, very excited to uh, be online with all of you today, and really look forward to answering any questions you may have. Um, let's see here. Can you see the screen? Okay. Sure. Is that working? Yeah, let's go ahead and start the webinar and we'll see if your screens are okay. properly aligned here. Yeah, we have your presenter view there. So Okay, so let me switch here. Sorry about that. It's all right. <laughs> We did practice this even ahead of time. It's a good looking family there, Sean Ray. <laughs> Thanks. That, that, that's my crew there. <laughs> Let's see. Are you still you're still seeing my uh yeah, if you go to the um the sh uh, uh, real quick, if you I, I'm sorry, folks, for this, but if you yeah. go to the uh, see that pause button that's right there on your screen, and then it says show and then screen. There. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, if you go to the go to webinar toolbox. And then go to show to oh. show. Oh gosh, okay, there. So show screen. And you you show yeah you have to show your presentation. No way. Is it not working there? Now we still have your presenter view. Okay. Sorry about that. Is it is that better? No, we still have a uh, your presenter view. That is so weird. I'm sorry. It's all right. Is that? Mm. No. Nope. I don't know what is going on. Technology or operator error might be more likely. Also, if you unplug your second screen, it w that presenter view will go away too. Okay. Still showing it? Yeah, unfortunately, I still have your uh, presenter view. Is it this one? Well, your screen is locked right now, so I'm sorry, folks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take Apologize. control back here. And then, um, and then what I will do is I will give control back over to you. Then, okay. And then we'll and then we'll try this again. Okay. Okay, is it a black, just a plain black screen there? Yes, yep. Plain black okay. screen. Right. Okay, perfect. Okay. So there we go. Good. Give this a try. Sorry about that technological error or operator error. I'm not 
that short. So uh, again, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I work uh, here in Oregon with uh, eight different irrigation districts, actually. But today, we're going to focus on one Central Oregon Irrigation District. And to start with, I'm going to play you uh, a commercial that we created for them, just to kind of give you an idea, set the scene. So Central Oregon Irrigation District was founded uh, 100 years ago. And the district uh, is, is very complex in the sense that when it, when it first was founded in 1918, it was really created um, you know, for farmers, just like all the other irrigation district was, to bring water to the land. Um, flash forward 100 years, ago, years later, um, we are, our district runs through a community called Bend, Oregon. Um, it's a very popular recreation area. It's been named one of the fastest growing uh, cities in the country. We're still under 100,000 people, but the, we get about 3 million visitors just to this town of Bend alone. And this area has been discovered. And so the community has grown up around the irrigation district. And this district in particular has uh, over 3,500 patrons or customers, and it's not just your typical you know, farmer or rancher that's using this water. These canals now run through the back of people's uh, residences in this town of community, in this community of Bend. So we now have uh, this really diverse mix of customers and people, and then the, the the audience has changed significantly in Central Oregon, where people who maybe grew up in a more rural ag-related background were familiar with the use of irrigated water, but now people moving here are not, and they were sold an irrigation canal as a water feature in their backyard as opposed to a means to deliver water to our customers. So. There's been a lot of discussion about why would irrigation districts need to communicate. And, and so that's what we're really going to talk about today is, is why would we even be involved in the business of communicating other than maybe to our patrons or our customers. So the first thing I think it's really important that we share with people is that we're advertising and communicating not to compete, um, but really just to share our message and communicate with people. So we do it for a variety of reasons. We do it for brand recognition because we want people to know who Central Oregon Irrigation District is as an organization. Um, we're a quasi-municipality, which means pretty much nothing to anyone. Like, what's a quasi-municipality? It sounds, you know, very government regulated. Um, so we need to communicate really the essence of what an irrigation district does. And by, by building a brand, we build credibility. Um, we really want people to know what we do, and we want to be credible for what we offer. We have a huge opportunity and a need to educate a very diverse stakeholder group. So we'll talk a little bit more in a bit about who those stakeholders are. So they range everywhere from elected officials to our customers to conservation and environmental groups and a lot of partners that we work with. So it's very important for us that they recognize what the irrigation district does and what we represent in the community. We also communicate to gather political support. Uh, just recently, um, we found out we have the opportunity to secure $25 million in federal funds. And that is going, that money will be used to modernize the irrigation districts. Um, we know that. 55% uh, plus of the water that we're losing in the, the canals is due to leaky canals and to our uh, you know, evaporation. And this area, uh, the Deschutes River, runs through uh, and is kind of the lifeblood of this region. And, and people flock to this area for recreational and lifestyle because of this river. Well, 
the irrigation districts in this basin use the, uh, the river, the water is used to deliver, as a delivery mechanism to get water into our canals and irrigation system. And so uh, a lot of the community uh, conservation and environmental groups um, became very uh, concerned about the way the irrigation districts were managing the water. And so a lot of the, the contention and the issues that the districts have faced have, become, have come uh, for political reasons because people thought we were mismanaging the water and not doing a good job to benefit uh, the fish and the wildlife. Um, in addition, you know, there's a lack of understanding about how the water is used once it's delivered um, on farm um, to our patrons. And so by spending a lot of time in D.C. and meeting with elected officials, we have really worked hard to educate them as well as to what our plans are and the, the efforts to modernize the system to benefit all, all the interested parties. So from the uh, people concerned about the river to the farmers and everyone, we've gained a lot of political support. And in turn, we're going to be receiving a lot of federal funds for that. Um, it also allows us to communicate about potential policy changes that might need to be made in the world. And then again, um, championing for these federal funds that are coming. We also communicate on a regular and very streamlined basis to generate different supporters and help garner public trust. And I'm going to share some headlines um, from a year and a half ago, and then I'm going to share some from today. Uh, the, really, the proof is in the pudding as we move, have moved the needle to gain support. We are not done. We will never be done. Uh, it's an ongoing uh, effort to continue to educate people and work with these people. It's very time intensive to gain support. It's not something that happens overnight. And, uh, but the efforts that we have done that I'm going to share with you today, they have worked and they are working. So we really look at it, it's an investment to have a communications uh, and a public relations strategy. And I always tell people that, yes, it is, it's an investment and there's a cost to it, but the cost to not doing it is detrimental. It, it, it absolutely can be. So today this story really is the story of an ogre, uh, what is known as the Oregon Spotted Frog and the Princess. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how this all comes together and how Central Oregon Irrigation District uh, is woven throughout this entire tale. But first, uh, talking about what a brand is. So I specialize in brand strategy and brand marketing. And a brand is really telling your story. And we all can think of organizations and companies that we are familiar with that have a brand, um, you know, Nike. Uh, you know, of course, Ford, Chevy, I mean, all of these organizations, McDonald's, everyone has a brand, and some organizations have a concentrated effort to create a brand. And then there are other organizations that don't control their brand, other people control their brand for them. So in the past, there, I don't know why there's two of those, there was a different one up there. Um, the Central Oregon Irrigation District had a brand. But it really was not controlling its brand in the sense that um, it really was, it was a logo, uh, a mark that was created, um, and there was a website, um, but it really wasn't a, a concentrated effort to tell a story about who is Central Oregon Irrigation District, what does Central Oregon District represent. And so at the beginning of this process about two years ago, we sat down and went through the, the process of saying, okay, who are we and who do we want to be? Because at the time, when you ask people, you know, who, who does Central Oregon Irrigation District represent? What comes to mind? I'm not kidding you. These are some of the things people would say the Irrigation District is the devil. Um, they're the bully. Um, they're a dictator. They are trying to rule our entire basin by telling us and regulating the water. So there was this feeling that the irrigation district was um, being a bully in the way that they manage the water and not working with partners to manage it for the good of all. You know, but the truth is 
perception is reality. I tell my kids that all the time. What people perceive to be true is their reality. And so that was the discussion we started with at Central Oregon Irrigation District. And under new management, the district said, you know, this is not really who we are. We have done things in the past, obviously, to make people feel this way. And this is their perception of us. So that's their reality. But what are we going to do to change this? We can do better. So who do we want to be? We don't want to be. Nobody, I don't think any organization wants to be known as a dictator or a devil. And so from there, we started the process of determining, you know, what do we look like? Where are we going? And part of that is, um, you know, just the mark and the logo that Central Oregon Irrigation District have. So um, many of the logos that are represented in this area are typical of the mountain, the stream, and the uh, the trees and such because it's just representative of our area, but it also was very outdated and had a different feel. So we went through this process of creating our story and saying, you know, really what we want to be is we want to be fresh. We want to be modern. We want to be progressive. We want to show our patrons, our customers, our stakeholders, our elected officials that we, we are a shining light. We provide a service here for our community that without us, and if we wouldn't have been founded, Central Oregon and this region would not be what it is today. And that, obviously, that was really not the, the state at the time when we had these conversations. It was, you know, that bully devil type thing. Whereas this was a very different take. And so we created this, this mark with the state of Oregon and this drop, that all, water drop, that also shows, you know, some movement, some color to really show this grounded in central Oregon, which is in the smack dab, we're smack dab in the middle of Oregon, and really say, you know what, this is who we are. This is what we want to look like. But we also want to hold true to our roots. We've been here since 1918, and, and that's something that the district is very proud of, that we've been around. And then we've used this as a taking off point to really start to identify who the district is and what we represent. So this is just a quick snapshot of what the Irrigation District website looked like. Um, in a lot of ways, I was impressed that they had one. I thought, okay, well, at least we have one. Um, it was very cluttered and hard to navigate. We talked to a lot of people. They're like, I don't even go on there because I really don't find exactly what I need. It wasn't super well um, updated. Um, so we took this as an opportunity again and to figure out how could we just clean this up? How do we like to receive information? Let's make it super simple and appealing and updated so that people can navigate their way around that. So the number one thing people said when they um, go to the website is they want to be able to pay their bill. So we put that right there first and foremost. They also have questions about you know, their water. It's, you know, I, I need information um, about my water in particular. I want to know about projects that you're working on and hydro. And then we get a lot of requests for resources and um, different things that we're partnering with. So we put a resources one on there. We try to just keep it really clean, again, modern, um, forward thinking. We included a lot of old photos, to, again, to pay homage to the history. So the district was bebopping along, uh, really, uh, I think, uh, was ahead of, ahead of things and other districts in the basin and certainly in the country in thinking, you know, we need a fresh new approach to how we do business. And as they were doing this, um, along came the frog. And this Oregon spotted frog um, became listed as a potential endangered species. It was actually threatened, so it's not listed as an endangered species, but it is a threatened species. And it caused absolute panic. So the reason it caused panic was because uh, some organizations decided to sue the irrigation districts, not just Central Oregon Irrigation Districts, but they decided to sue the irrigation districts over the way they manage the water that is negatively impacting this threatened spotted frog. And it just started coming. So there was the, the threatening lawsuit. At the same time, some other groups were getting a little spun up and had knew that Central Oregon Irrigation District was looking at piping a section of the canal behind their community in Bend in this town. And these neighbors were not happy. So 
they also decided to sue the irrigation district at the same time. So again, it, people were in full panic, both the agriculture community because there was an impending injunction where there was a possibility that all water was going to be shut off to the irrigation community um, pending a judge's ruling uh, on this injunction. And it was a year ago in March, so in March of 2016, when this went before a judge, we weren't sure if we were going to have water to deliver to our patrons because of this lawsuit. So it, it just went on and on. Um, it was, I would consider, a crisis for uh, the clients in the Deschutes Basin. Um, and we were getting beat up, I would say, almost daily on social media and pretty much uh, several times a week in the media, both through letters to the editor, op-eds. Um, and we were getting calls from all over the country because people are saying, what's going on out there in Oregon? Why, why are you guys in this big lawsuit? So the question comes up, why do we care what people are saying? And um, I think intuitively we all know we try not to care what people say about us, but the truth is we do and we have to, especially if you're an organization um, or you represent somebody. And at the end of the day, what had happened and was happening was that other people, and I call them they, were telling the story and they were labeling and branding the irrigation districts. So because the irrigation districts in the past had focused on what their core mission is, which is to deliver water to their customers, they weren't focused on going out and thinking about needing to educate all the new people moving into this region to say, you know, irrigated agriculture is incredibly important. Do you know how important it is and do you know why it's important? So a lot of people, their first introduction to irrigated agriculture was from these lawsuits. And people were like, well, of course they should take care of this frog. And, and why aren't they taking care of the frog? And the groups that sued the districts we're so far ahead of where the irrigation districts were in having a strategy and communicating their story that the districts just were getting absolutely beat up. And it, it took a toll, absolutely. So in the middle of all of that, um, the districts hired me and said, you know, can you help us? We, we've got to get in front of this. I mean, we, they were in defense mode and our goal was to move them into offense mode. So this brings us to this, this point, kind of to pause here about the frog, but managing reputation is incredibly important. And I, I tell people this both for you personally, it's important that you manage your reputation. We all know that if you have kids or family members, you say, you know, you have a reputation whether you want to or not. Um, and, and managing it, it's a proactive event. It's something you have to do. You can't let others manage your reputation. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. And for an organization, it's equally, if not as important or more important. So reputation management, it's the strategy and a process of really managing your reputation and your credibility. It's not just letting it happen. A lot of organizations that I work with will you know, say, well, people are saying this about us. And, and I'll ask, well, why are they saying that? And they're like, well, we don't know because you know somebody just made that up or someone just put that on social media. And I said, well, what are you telling them to say? Well, we haven't really told them to say anything. <clears throat> and that's usually where the problem occurs is that if you're not out there telling people what you want them to know about your organization, they will make things up. And um, in, in this day and age with everyone having access and a platform to social media and you know the internet, People can say anything and hide behind a keyboard and people don't know if it's credible or not. So we have to work incredibly hard as organizations to make sure that we are telling it and having that credibility. So there's proactive brand and reputation management and there's reactive. And you know the, the question is, would you rather be on the pro proactive side or the reactive side? And I can answer this um, knowing of all the people I've worked with. It is much more fun to be on the proactive side than the reactive side. Um, Central Oregon Irrigation District was on the right path in being proactive, and then the frog happened, and 
we were all of a sudden more reactive. If we had started maybe five years ago or three years ago before the spotted frog came along, we'd have been in a very different position. Some of the other districts had not started at all, so they were 100% reactive. Um, all that to say, it's a lot more fun to play offense than it is defense. Because again, it builds trust and credibility. If someone says something negative about your organization, but they're familiar with who you are, or they know your team, and they say, you know what, um, I know they're getting beat up today, and I saw another headline, but I actually am familiar with that irrigation district, and I know they do a lot of really good work, and they work with the 4-H and the FFA kids, and they're, they're involved in the community. That's, those are the types of things that are really important. Word of mouth is by far always the best form of communications and marketing. There is no ad in the world that you can buy or any press release in the world that you can put out that is as effective as word of mouth. So having, I call them evangelists, people out in the community or in your sphere of influence who are telling your story and helping you repu manage your reputation, they're worth their weight in gold because we can't be all places to communicate. The irrigation district manager or the president of an organization cannot be in all places to communicate all the good things that their organization does. So you need those evangelists out there doing that on behalf of you. And that's a, that's a focused effort. You have to identify those people and, and give them the tools so that they can really be your word of mouth. It also allows us to really control the brand, the stories, and the voice. And if you have an established reputation and a positive one, when things happen, bad things happen, and you're getting beat up, and I see it happen all the time with organizations, it's a lot easier to come back from negative things and you know defend yourself if you have an established reputation to begin with. So here are six rules for reputation management. So number one is if something happens in the event that you have a, a spotted frog or something pops up in your organization um, or with your clients that you weren't ex expecting, the first thing to do is handle the negative. Take care of it, address it, be transparent, uh, you know, handle it in a way that you would want an organization to speak to you. If you make a mistake, own it. That was one of the first things in working with the irrigation districts and, you know, we were getting beat up about how we were managing or mismanaging the river. I asked the, the managers, are we? Are we, are we doing a poor job? And if we are, we need to own it. And, and, you know, they say admitting it is the first step. So handling the negative. Accentuating the positive. So don't letting all the negative completely take over, but saying, you know, yes, we acknowledge we can do better. Absolutely. We're not doing the best. We're working on it. Here are some of the things that we're doing to make improvements. And highlight those every opportunity you can through your social media, through your e-newsletters, um, through news stories. Be authentic. The only, there's nothing worse than when you hear someone talking or speaking and you feel like it's just rhetoric and it's not really genuine. Um, I always encourage people just, you know, speak from your heart, but be authentic. Don't just repeat what someone else said because, you know, it sounds like the right thing to say. Say it and, and be authentic about it. Be consistent. Uh, when, when we uh, were going through this process of trying to figure out how to handle the negative uh, communications that was coming at us, it was really important for us to sit down and develop our messaging and to make sure that all the irrigation district uh, managers and employees had the same set of tools and I call it their toolbox. So what are, you know, even a ditch rider, someone who's out on a daily basis working along the irrigation district, that if, if a customer came out to them, a patron came out to them while they were just walking walk the ditch and said, hey, what's going on with that spotted frog? How come, you know, this is happening? We wanted to make sure that we equipped everyone from the people who were out in the field to the managers, um, to the people who answered the phones with the right messaging so that we were all consistent and all saying the same thing. Being transparent, again, you know, just being very open and admitting things. It's, you know, similar to being authentic, but owning it if you have something. And then really focus on build brand building and relationships. So 
part of the problem that we faced was that the districts were busy doing their job, which is getting water to their patrons and managing that process. And that should be their focus. But at the same time, with the change that this region was going through, there was a huge need to go out in the community and make sure that these conservation groups were aware of our future plans to make improvements because the districts were working towards system improvement plans to improve both how the water was delivered but also that would directly benefit the river and in turn benefit the wildlife and the habitat. But that had never been communicated because you know, you're busy running your business. And so when all of this happened, we realized that there was a huge opportunity to create these relationships and educate people so that they again could become our boots on the ground in telling our story in a better way. And I've got a great story about that I'll share with you here in a little bit. So there's three steps really to reputation management. The first one is really to identify your target audiences. So for our purposes, we really had three main audiences we needed to educate about what the districts were doing. So the first are our customers, which we call patrons. So for Central Oregon Irrigation District, we have right around 3,500 patrons. They range all the way from um, the town that it's just the irrigation district is running through their backyard, all the way out to major cattle uh, and hay producers. Um, we have a very, very, very diverse group of customer base. We also have a lot of hobby uh, farmers, um, people who maybe moved into the region, have never had irrigated uh, agriculture, um, don't know much about that. They need a lot of educating, but they also, they may have six or seven acres and have two llamas on it, and they don't really know, you know what they need to do with that land to keep it. So we have to educate that first group. The second are the stakeholders. So again, those are the conservation groups, um, our partners with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, any of those conservation groups that needed to be aware of our future plans and have conversations with them. And then third, um, the media. The second step after identifying target audiences is really to look at your reputation and this can be a really great gut check. I always encourage organizations to do this. It's, it's a great exercise to do with an executive team or your management, is to go through a SWOT analysis. And SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So this is one of the first things that we did with the irrigation district. Okay, what are we really good at? What are our strengths? Um, you know, we are we have a really great loyal group of employees who've been here a really long time. They know water. They know water management. We have a new manager who is progressive and forward thinking. Um, we have 3,500 patrons. You know, we went through all that. Weaknesses, people don't know who we are. There's a misperception about what we do. We're not communicating. Um, our opportunities, sometimes your weaknesses and your opportunities can be the same. Our opportunities were absolutely to brand and communicate better. And then threats are typically things that are outside of our control. Those can be government regulations, federal reg regulations, things that are happening um, on a regulatory role level that we really don't have any control over, but good for organizations to be aware of. The third is to create an action plan. And after you know who you're trying to speak to and you know where your opportunities and you know, challenges are, create a plan that outlines, okay, how are we going to go about doing this? So that brings us to how is COID managing its reputation? How do we go from being an ogre to a princess? And I wish I could say you could snap your fingers and it would happen overnight, but it doesn't. Um, one of our action items was to bring a face to what we do and who we serve. Because if you just went out into the community and you said, okay, what does the irrigation district do? You might get 25 or 100 different responses. Um, some people would say they take water away from me. They take water away from the wildlife. Some people say they deliver the water so that I can grow hay. So it was very diverse, and because of the, the population we serve, 
we decided to create a series of commercials and videos which we rolled out um, we, we ran them uh, mostly through social media and ran a campaign so I'll show you this first one hey Sean Sean writes John I, 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 Jump real quick. We're not getting the sound on the commercials, so I suggest oh. that we link to these after, maybe on our website when we oh, post okay. them. Okay. That would be okay. Great. okay. So you can't hear oh. that. No, okay. we can't. So oh, okay. We'll go, ahead. we'll go ahead. For those in the call, we'll go ahead and link those. If you go to the uh, irrigation.org slash webinar underscore series, we'll have all these commercials linked to to where that is, so you can reference okay. those later on. I appreciate that. No, my apologies for that. So we created this series, and uh, we hired a video production company. To help us do that and again uh, they were very very well received one you know from our patrons the people who that we went out and videoed were very appreciative that we were taking the time to tell their story and then also um, just the response in the community to say okay well I didn't know that that nursery in Central Oregon was reliant on irrigation water or the hospital system in our community they get their water for all of their you know, green areas in the parks and rec from the irrigation district. So we started to tell that. The section, second action item was community involvement. The irrigation districts have done a good job typically in the past of being involved in the community and supporting causes, but really had never told anyone. Um, so there's that old saying, if you do something but you don't tell people about it, did it actually happen? So we made a, a an effort to make sure that anytime we were doing things that would benefit the community that we would share them on social media and we would do a better job of, of telling our story. So we did things like at our pumpkin patch, one of our clients or one of our patrons uh, has this wildly popular pumpkin patch and so we went out with them and he let us put signs out that says this farm is watered by Central Oregon Irrigation District and he's allowed us to attend his pumpkin patch to do educational events with kids. We did an event called a fish rescue um, or fish relocation, which when because of the way that the water is ramped up and down for season, um, there were fish that would be stranded um, in the river. And so we organized a relocation. We brought in teams of people to take those fish so they didn't die if they were stranded and relocate them to other parts of the river. Uh, we sponsored uh, things at the fairs, and then we also have a mascot, Otto the Otter, and uh, we took him out to, to meet with the kids and do different events throughout the community. Uh, another key important component that the districts have done in the past but had never really told anybody was that we are really passionate about educating uh, the youth in our community. Uh, Central Oregon Irrigation District goes into every second grade school in our region and teaches canal safety. Super important that kids understand you know, what a canal is, why we don't play in them, and how, how to be safe. Uh, we also offer tours of the hydro plants so they understand uh, renewable energy. And we work with different schools and their science programs to educate them as well about the use of irrigated agriculture. Another action item was to secure this political support, and so we have been successful again in securing some uh, federal funding, and I think in part because of these uh, relationships that the district managers have fostered in making sure that people, when they come to our area, they're getting tours of the region. And going back to being transparent, uh, we have produced and put together uh, Plans. Like we have a system improvement plan. We also did what we call an on-farm efficiency plan, which really outlines here are our plans to modernize our system. Here's what we're going to do. And we made that public. It's on our website. And I think, again, it just goes back to education and people being aware. And they're not thinking that we're trying to hide information or trying to do things that maybe aren't, you know, for the good of of the entire basin for the district and for the patrons and for the river. And so just by having these pieces that we've produced collateral, these brochures, and we put them in flip books on our website, we found that people, they appreciate that. They just appreciate having access to that information. Another action item was building partnerships and alliances. Uh, we have made a very focused effort to build relationships with community partners and I can tell you that from a year and a half ago to where we are today it is a completely different uh, relationship 
there were some meetings that I walked into a year and a half ago that I would consider to be volatile and very uncomfortable because um, there was a lot of finger pointing and you're not doing this and the districts, you know, aren't being honest and telling the truth. And thanks to wonderful people who work at the districts and board members, um, we've made significant progress to the point where a lot of these partners are advocating on our behalf now, um, happily advocating for us. And that's really, to me, when I look back a year ago from where we are today, it's probably one of the things that I think the district should be most proud of is that we've made progress with relationships. And that's, again, come from spending time with them, taking them on tours, being transparent, allowing them to be a part of our planning process and understanding what it is that our ultimate goal is as far as modernizing our system so it benefits everyone. We've also focused on media and public relations and we have, uh, in the past, the media coverage that the districts were getting was really uh, in response. So uh, editor would call and say, hey, we're hearing that you guys are managing the river right and you know, the way that you're outsourcing the water is controversial. What do you want to say about that? So we took the approach of trying to figure out how can we be proactive and absolutely still tell the story, but we want to be in the driver's seat. And so we have um, had, you know, dozens of uh, reporters and editors that we've spent time with, taking tours with, sat down with editorial boards, and just educated them about it. And as you'll see here in a minute, some of the, the media that we've received has been a direct reflection of that. So the frog, really, over the past year and a half, has helped us transform from an ogre into a princess. I, I don't know if we've had a full transformation, and we're never completely done, but we, we have made some, some headway. So here are some of the headlines that have come in the past year since we started our efforts. Pipe around the Pilot Butte Canal, which was the neighbors that were suing the irrigation district because they didn't want their backyard water, what they consider their water feature to be piped. Um, we went and sat down with the editorial board at our paper and said, you know, here, here's what's happening. And they wrote an editorial saying, just go around them in support of the irrigation districts. This was the, the fish event. This was published. Um, Rescue effort aims to save stranded to shoot through her fish. Again, you know, we're, we were being proactive saying, we're going to, well, this is temporary because we're doing a much bigger fix in the long run. But for now, we're going to do our best to make sure that no fish um, die. We started receiving letters and emails from people in the community. Uh, this one is an example. You know, writing to everyone who helps control the flow of the river to let them know that the small additional amount of water being released this year has made a significant improvement. Um, I know that setting these release flows is difficult. I hope my message will be provide useful information. Thank you for the water. I mean, this is a 180 from what we received a year ago, which I would almost consider to be hate mail, to getting these types of letters, again, from people. Um, that government, political, elected official side of things, um, local national officials prioritize canal piping. Um, we've had really great success in having our elected officials to come alongside of us. But again, that was, a, that was an effort that we made, conscious effort to, to have happen. Uh, this, uh, this actually is just from this week. Change coming to Central Oregon Irrigation Districts. Three districts will, be, will hold public meetings in July. Um, we've made sure that anytime we're going to do something or have a public meeting that we're transparent, we send out the mailers to it, we meet with the media so they're aware of, of what we're trying to do. This one uh, is a guest column that was just written. It was published last week. It's from one of the advocacy groups here in our region who was to say skeptical is uh, and, and frustrated with what the districts were doing a year ago is, is putting it lightly. We um, have spent a lot of time with this organization, and fortunately for us, they were willing to learn about the districts and try and come alongside us and help us figure out, okay, you know, what is it that you need to know and what do you need from us so that we can help you. They're, they're, they just want to make the river better. And so 
we are working side by side with them to figure out, let's make the river better, but we also need you to know that we still have to deliver water to our patrons. And this organization now is writing voluntarily guest columns on and are, um, you know, representing us saying, we don't have to grant everything, we never will, but we're going to work together because we have to work with the irrigation districts and we believe in this. And um, this is this is a huge change for us in what has happened. Um, this is also something recently the irrigation districts opened a new fish ladder and we did a ribbon cutting uh, and uh, we had a great turnout. We had a lot of uh, media coverage over it. I could say probably two years ago was the districts would have opened this up. They just would have opened it and released uh, the ladder and not just anything about it now. And now they recognize that we do good work. We need to we need to tell people about it. And this has helped create a lot of that goodwill in the community as well. We do have a social media presence and we don't put a lot of money into it, but we have noticed that you know just putting and posting stories and boosting certain things has really increased our ability to um, connect with our patrons and also our stakeholders. And I, I really like this this saying from Warren Buffett: "It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently." And I really believe as organizations and individuals, um, we have to really be thinking about what is our reputation, how do we manage it, how do we communicate it, and have a strategy in place so that, you know, you may never have an Oregon spotted frog in your business, you know, and it doesn't have to be a frog, it could be anything. But if something like that happens, you know, what will happen? How are you going to handle it? And what's your reputation going to be like because of it? Can you tackle that head on and because you already have a great reputation and you made those efforts, can you survive it? I've seen organizations go completely under because they didn't have a great reputation to begin with and then something like this they could never recover from. So it's just a great thing to keep in mind and being proactive, uh, it definitely does take an investment of time and resources, but one that um, we certainly have found to see working for this district and in the Deschutes Basin. Are there, uh, I'd love to open up for any questions or comments. All right, thanks, Sean. I really appreciate that. It's fantastic information, and uh, it's good to see that thought process behind the campaign, because I think a lot of folks see the campaigns and what they produce, but the thought process and how those get done, I think, is very valuable information and exactly what we wanted to uh, to discuss here today. So I'm going to go ahead and um, take the control back over to my screen here. And uh, if any of you have any questions, we have about a minute or two left. Uh, please go ahead and type those in. I will go ahead and I have two of my own that I wanted to ask Sean Ray, but if anybody wants to jump in, that's great. First one, Sean Ray, how was it? Um, how was this campaign, especially on the front end, how was it received internally? Did you get any resistance from those members of the irrigation district as you started going down this road, which I can see a lot of folks being uncomfortable with, with going through this process? It's a great question, John. And, I, you know, I have to say, uh, you know, typically uh, a lot of organizations struggle with going out and tooting their own horn. You know, I mean, it's not – a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't have to do that. You know, we're good people. We do good work. There, There is oftentimes I find a level of discomfort. Um, this group, I think that they knew they had to make some changes. Um, we didn't get a lot of pushback internally from the team. The manager who um, I've been working alongside that, that manages the district had been in place uh, for a little over a year and had been pushing for this type of change to happen. So it wasn't like overnight, all of a sudden, you know, like, oh, we're going to have a new logo. And we're going to have this ad campaign. I think people actually were, were really good about embracing it and have been very supportive because they saw what was happening. Nobody, I mean, the board of directors for the irrigation district too, you know, nobody wants to get accosted at the post office <laughs> by right. someone. And so I think that we just were at that point where people were like, okay, we have to make a change. And let's hope that this works. And fortunately for us, it has made progress and, and they've been committed to it. So 
I think overall very positively received. And then uh, the other question is, uh, part of your presentation you talked about going through the SWOT process, but before that you talked about uh, looking at different audiences and those you talked about were customers, stakeholders, and media. Did you find that targeting one worked better than the other, or was it truly a combined approach with targeting all three of those audiences? Sure. Again, great question. Uh, you know, our, probably our customer base, our patrons, are the most diverse because we have everyone from people who have been, you know, using irrigated agriculture for you know 50 plus years multi-family generational farmers to people who just moved here and you know bought five acres and have no idea you know how to manage it so our our patron base is more diverse and probably the most complicated because we've got that wide spectrum we also have the challenge of some people don't have ea and you know there's a huge cost to do direct mailers it's expensive um, some people aren't on social media so trying to figure out how to communicate to our patrons has been the most challenging i think we had to get we had to get our patrons on board first you know and we still continue to do that we want them to be the people they're the users if they're happy and they feel well informed they'll be those evangelists out for us in the community um, but I, I would say that's been the most complex. And then, mm -hmm. you know, bringing along the media, um, you just have to have, you have to have good information to provide for them. We did. We just had to make sure it up and gave it to them in the way that they wanted to hear it. Yeah. Well, good. Listen, I, I, it, great answer, and it's a great perspective, and I, I really appreciate it again, Sean Ray, for, for what you've done, not only in Central Oregon, because what you've done, I think, can be copied throughout the United States and other areas that are seeing the same challenges you're doing, but also what you're doing specifically for uh, your members and the community in Oregon as well. I wanted to quickly just uh, let folks know that we do have one more webinar in our series on July 13th, Water Infrastructure in America, Challenges and Opportunities for Irrigated Agriculture. Another Oregonian, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Dan Kapin from the Family Farm Alliance, who Sean Ray referenced during her presentation, and Laura Ziemer with Trot Unlimited, another organization that has partnered in Central Oregon as well. Uh, but with that said, I want to thank you all for, for joining us today. Sean Ray, thank you again very much. And I encourage all of you to reference back, take a look at those ads that Sean Ray mentioned. We'll have those linked up on our website here pretty soon. And uh, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone for joining and Sean Ray for your presentation. Thank you for the opportunity and I appreciate it. Thanks for all the work that you're doing as well. Great, thanks.